We hear God's voice in the Bible and in teaching, in music and prayer. Listen for God's voice in these readings. The first is found in Deuteronomy. Moses said, The Lord your God will rise up for you, a prophet like me, from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Herob on the day of the assembly, when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, You are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who will speak them everything I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. Word of God, word of life. To honor the risen Christ in our midst, we stand for this reading from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, throwing him into convulsions and crying in a loud voice, came out of him. They were amazed. And they kept asking one another, What is this? A new teaching? With authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Word of God, word of life. Lord God, now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts here together be acceptable in your sight, you who are the rock and the redeemer who brings us back again and again when we have strayed. Amen. Dear friends in the church, as the body of Christ, all are equals. It is this associative quality that provides the freedom to explore our belief, to achieve intimacy, and to express God's love. Clergy are not merely professional employees. They are equal members of the body. For the pastor and the people to be well connected, the people must also join the pastor. This mutual membership and mutual negotiation is a spiritual ministry in which pastor and people equip each other and so liberate all the people of God for ministry and mission in this world. So write James Anderson and Ezra Jones in their book, Management of Ministry. That said, one of the major ingredients in any kind of endeavor of spiritual ministry is what I would call load management. For example, a college student must have special permission from the dean to take more than a certain number of courses per semester. An overloaded schedule results in time management difficulties and unhealthy personal stress. When we look at our increasing daily utilization of available energy, we know that most cities have a load management system of regulating the 
electricity that is used in homes. City energy departments give discounts to customers who employ such devices. At our Minnesota house, we have what's called dual fuel. These options of Crow Wing Power Company. But during the peak load periods, the load management device that we have makes some choices for us, for our benefit. Major overload and surprising shutdowns can be avoided. For years, a certain city had labored with a major soft drink company to secure an electronic scoreboard for its little league park. Finally, the scoreboard arrived, and a crew from the city installed it. It worked fine for two games, showing the runs, the hits, the errors, the inning, the balls, the strikes, and the outs. Then mysteriously, during the second inning of operation in the third game, it froze. The control would not activate it. The lights stayed stuck on for the same inning, the same score, the same ball and strike account. It had to be shut down. Someone took the control box home and tested all the connections. It tested out fine. They feared bigger problems within the unit, like you and I maybe needing a new engine in our car. Then the next day, an electrician from the city came out, and it only took her a second to discern the problem without even looking at anything. Operator error, she said. Somebody pushed all of the buttons at the same time. You can only push one button at a time, she said, for inside that complicated apparatus is a little fuse. If you pump more current into the fuse than it can bear, it shuts down. No surprise, is it? The human machine, of which you and I are, also has a little fuse between the ears. It's called the brain. It can handle joy, frustration, grief, love, anger, pain, and just about anything and everything that passes through it. That is, one at a time. Push all the buttons at once, and it freezes. It becomes catatonic. Its fuse blows. Even though all the vital signs look great, the big engine shuts down. We call it depression, emotional overload, burnout. The spirit, the wind, the breath of life is flattened. It's pressed in on. It's squeezed. It's taken away, often completely by surprise. It's happened to us all, and it can happen to you and I again. We're all dealing with some level of emotional and spiritual and physical load management all of the time. I just talked to a couple in the back there on my way in this morning, and I realized there's another degree of load management. It has to do with these things, right? Ever sat with a group of people, nobody looks at anybody, everybody looks just at these? Nobody talks. We have to be responsible individually to manage the load that this little thing puts on us. And I was just also thinking, this congregation has had a mortgage just wanted to pay up, right? It's been a load on our budget. What did you guys do this last couple, three, four weeks? You managed the load, right? Right? Yeah. Praise God. <laughs> it's true. The squeezes breed anxiety, unaddressed anxiety about anything or anyone, breaks out into conflicts of sorts. Human urges, desires, ambitions are frustrated, and dreams and abilities that tend to unhinge us make us go to pieces. Surely some kind of predictability is needed. Load management is no less real and necessary among religious issues, is it? There are hundreds of expressions and understandings of God from which we find we and our fellow human beings seek community and must make choices. What about our responsibility, our responsibility to God, who we claim in Christ as the Lord of our lives? Is this God a powerful force ready to lash out to fall silent, 
or to cut us off once we break a commandment? Is this God a submissive presence at the beck and call of every devout prayer group? Is this God an exhibitionist or a perfectionist? If all of our human problems merge into a last resort of some kind of a religious outlook or solution, then what, if anything, helps us to manage the load of the competing claims about God? How do we reconcile all of the extreme attributions made to God by frightened and hope-starved people? Where do we and our Christian witnesses actually witness to the truth of God? Where is the solid rock? Big questions. Questions that surround us all and cry out for an answer that helps. And so once again, the politics of an election year symbolize the quest for the truth that we all seek to inform and to guide us in our decisions about our tomorrows. Does God have a certain predictable character which manages our world's religious load? The matter of spiritual load management or is something else at work here? The word for the day from today's scripture in Deuteronomy is yes, God does have a certain predictable character. In a world of competing religious claims and much human confusion, the Israelites are told that God will raise up a prophet to reveal God's will. This prophet will be like Moses, so everyone will be able to recognize him. He will bear remarkable similarities to Moses. Today's gospel confirms that Jesus' own understanding of his own identity His mission and his method in life was in line with the life of Moses. He, too, lived in a world that had become unhinged, chaotic, uncertain about God. But his words spoke authority. His words were recognized as God's word, and it conveyed security, understanding, reliability, compassion, and love. No knee-jerk reflexes to human actions. No multiple personalities of God responding to various human attitudes. There would be a unified character of God, a certain recognizable predictability that would manage the load. The key would be Moses' life, about which the Pentateuch, those first five books of the Bible, would be rich in sharing the wisdom and the love of God to people. Moses sorted out the true prophets from the false ones. He cared for God's people. And he too, like Jesus, was a good shepherd, wasn't he? The old tradition Moses would help make to be the new tradition of Jesus. God's revelation of himself in Jesus, who became the Christ, who was ongoing and recognizable and good to us and for us. And so on this fourth Sunday in the season of Epiphany, this Epiphany of God and Christ, we see that as as went Moses, so goes Jesus. Then Moses and Israel were in bondage to Egypt, and yet still today, dear friends, we are in bondage to sin and death. The Egyptian pharaoh, as you know, received a sign in a dream, consulted with his staff, and decides to massacre the male human children, the Hebrew children out of fear that Jesus would be among them. Moses is rescued, as you know, from the Nile and eventually secures an Egyptian education. Mary and Joseph rescue the infant Jesus by fleeing to Egypt where their son receives his formal education. The Egyptian soldiers die in the water by the sea to give liberation to all those who are in bondage. In like manner, the waters of our baptism, yours and mine, symbolized for you and for me the death of our old self and the birth of our new life in the risen Christ. Yes, Moses and Israel wander 40 years in the wilderness where God feeds his people by manna and at Sinai gives them the purpose of their calling. Christ is tempted in the wilderness for 40 days where his purpose is revealed, that he comes forth as the bread of life for the human community. And friends, we live our lives in the wilderness too, don't we? Life is not black or white, we know that. 
it has lived mostly in the gray zone. Just think back to COVID-19 at its worst. We lived there and many died there. Whether we lived or whether we would have died, we were managing a heavy load and many people still feel the effects of that heavy load and are trying to get free of it. Today, we live under a, under a new and challenging load of care in our country and in our world. But by God's grace, we live. The parallels, though, don't stop there. We can see that the exodus and the cross are tied together with dramatic unity. The exodus under Moses and the cross of Jesus are actual events in our human history, aren't they? Both create groups, Israel and the church. Both proclaim a saving message. And so in 17 short days, we as a congregation of the Church of Jesus Christ are privileged to again begin our 40-day walk with God. This reliable, dependable, predictable God who faithfully manages the load of care that each of us carries. He manages it, as C.S. Lewis says, with the weight of his glory. That is the victory he won on the cross for us. For it was on the cross that that victory became ours as well. Not because, because he didn't count being equal with God an important thing, but he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. 40 Lenten days of listening, 40 Lenten days for us to show the way that we care. Whenever someone calls you to walk the walk or talk the talk of your Christian faith, take the invitation as if it were from the lips of Jesus. Here at Our Saviors, we have important listening and caring to do in this in-between time. Come to our weekly town halls, even today, and learn. Did you know that of all the seasons of the liturgical church year, the season of Lent is most like the interim period in the life of a congregation, the time between the no longer and the not yet, a time of creative, active waiting, active listening, as did Jesus in those final hours in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember your baptism, dear friends. When you were baptized, you were buried with Christ by baptism into his death, so that if he was raised from the dead, so too shall you and I have new life. You need new life. I need new life. We all need the new life in Christ every single day. His love is what manages your load of care. His love does that for you. He will help you let go of what has kept your spirit low. He will help you let God be the load management factor in your new life. What a gift. Look at Moses. Look at Jesus. They had to overcome personal torments, inner struggles, self-doubts, and fear through commitment to their higher calling a call that each of us received at the moment of our baptism. As I told one of our hurting members this past week, don't give that incident or that event or that person or don't give that memory so much staying and straying power over you that your life becomes unhinged, depressed, and go to pieces because of a burnt fuse. You have the power to change that. Don't succumb to operator error. You have the gift of God's love given and shed for you in his blood, which we'll receive in just a few moments by his grace once again. You have God's word that he is with you. Stay with him and live the abundant life here and now. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, so it is now and will always be, even unto the close of this age. Amen.